Today, I will be reviewing the RTX 3070. This is actually the first Ampere card I will be doing a review on, and so I actually think it's quite important to become accommodated to all of the latest architectures to form, let's say, a more informed opinion than someone that just looks at what other people are analyzing online. Now, this review will come hot off the heels of my 6800 XT review, which I think is important to recap my overall opinion there. You see, I found my 6800 XT Nitro Plus that I tested, a card that maintained 2.75 gigahertz clock speeds while gaming to be incredibly powerful and honestly more impressive to me than I expected. But at the end of the day, if it's going to sell for over $1,000 on average, I just don't think that's a fair price. I think that it was, without a doubt, an enthusiast card, the most impressive performance increase I've seen in quite a while, but something that should just cost $700 or less. You know what I think we should expect enthusiast graphics cards to cost, not two grand or more. And that expectation of pricing was from the point of view of someone looking to upgrade from what I would call a typically above average high-end graphics card. Something like a Radeon 7, 2080, 1080 Ti, or even something like a 2070 Super or 5700 XT. You know, not top of the line, but very powerful. I decided that those graphics cards that, in my experience, can typically run the overwhelming majority of games at something around 1800p, 90 frames per second, mostly locked, that going from that to 4K 120 with a 6800 XT wasn't worth a thousand dollars it it looked nicer and look 4k 120 is a lot more pixels per second quantitatively than 1800p 90 frames per second but were the games any more fun outside of a couple of edge cases that got even bigger performance increases than that the answer was no it's about the gameplay not about pixel counting and that difference though quantitatively big was not worth the money. And so from that frame of reference is where I go into the 3070, which I, of course, do not expect to be close to a 6800 XT, let alone a great overclocking one in performance. But it should be notably better than the Radeon 7. And so the question I'm going to ask, well, there's a few. The first one is, yeah, if you're someone with a 1080 Ti, should you want the 3070? Or what type of shopper with that caliber, like 2080 class graphics card, should be looking for something like this? And furthermore, people who typically buy $400 to $500 cards, you know, someone with like a Vega card or a uh, 2070, 2060 Super, is this performance increase over that class of card something worth getting excited about? And most importantly, right before 6700 XT reviews, which will be covered very soon on this channel, by the way, right before the 6700 XT launches, which will be the challenger to this 3070, the overall question really is, in the new upper mid-range, how much should this really cost? Because they're selling for over $700 on Newegg, typically. How much is this performance really worth to me, if prices start to normalize, what price point would I say if you have either a mid-range or previous-gen high-end card, what should you pay for this? But anyways, enough yammering on. We should get into the full review now. And just like my 6800 XT review, I'm going to start with quantitative benchmarks. A handful of graphics cards I've been able to get my hands on and a handful of games. Just a handful. I'm not Gamers Nexus. I'm not Hardware Unbox. I'm not going to spend... What would take me a month and just thousands of dollars trying to compete in the numbers game? But I do think it's important to start with some kind of a quantitative comparison so we get, you know, some expectations set ahead of time and heck, just to make sure everything's working properly. So let's get in it. Quantitatively, what performance are we looking at with the 3070 relative to the other graphics cards I have around? And just as a reminder, those other graphics cards I have around include an RTX 2060 laptop that has been overclocked and undervolted to perform close to a desktop 2060, a good stand-in for mid-range graphics cards, next to a Vega 64 that is one of the best overclocking samples I've ever had in my life. That thing performs closer to a Radeon 7 than a lot of people would like to see, and it's a good stand-in for a 5700 or 2070. Then, of course, my previous-gen high-end card, the Radeon 7, and the 6800 XT results will be here next to a 2080 Ti as well. Not going to dwell on these samples too much. Watch the previous review if you want more info. We need to get to the benchmarks. And the first one I want to go through is Metro Exodus because I think it sets the tone for the overall review. Look, 
The 3070 is a round a 2080 Ti, and mine gained a decent amount, not as much in this game, but a decent amount in most games from high memory overclocking. GA104 feels a bit bandwidth starved in its current iteration to me, and I don't know what else there is to say. This is in between a 6800 XT and a Radeon 7, although a bit closer to the Radeon 7 in overall performance. Basically, there's a few settings you don't need to turn down as much and if we go to the next game which is far cry 5 we can see that indeed the 3070 matched the 2080 ti at stock and it gained almost 10 percent from its mostly memory overclocking it was after overclocking only about 12 percent or so behind a uh 6800 xt nitro plus but way behind it after that one was overclocked in this game god that game it gained a lot once i relieved the power limit on it and it was you know I mean, look, it's like 25% better than my overclocked Radeon 7. That is good. But again, that's usually just a handful of settings. Deus Ex Mankind Divided was an interesting one. This game really liked the 2080 Ti versus the 3070. Although, again, the 6800 XT absolutely left everything below it in the dust. And if we go to the next game, Strange Brigade, this one was an interesting one and in how much it just likes Vega. I mean, really uh of course everything pretty much lines up how you would expect it to but that's something to keep in mind is this in game here is an example that you know even after overclocking there will be some games that are less than 20 percent different between a radeon 7 to a 3070 overclock to overclock the 3070 is closer to like a 2080 in performance than it is to a 3080 and the Division 2 is another game to look at here where, again, everything lines up as you would expect it to. But only, like, again, overclock to overclock, you're looking at about 25% better than a Radeon 7 or 1080 Ti or something like that. And the average shows it all. Relative to a 6800 XT Nitro, you know, the 3070 overclocked is only about 25% better than an overclocked Radeon 7. And compared to an overclocked 6800 XT, it is more than 25% behind it. It's in between, but it is closer to a Radeon 7, especially given it only has 8 gigabytes of VRAM, which I will get to in the qualitative benchmarks soon. But overall, what I think is obvious is the 3070 is not better than the previous gen flagship of like a 2080 Ti or Titan RTX. It is about that level of performance and that means you know if we were talking about how the 2080 ti wasn't worth the extra money you know versus a 2080 super or a radeon 7 you know, like double the price for 20 to 30 percent more performance then i mean if you have a 2080 and you're thinking of spending 700 dollars for this you're only spending that much for about 30 percent more performance at most and that much more performance is usually just a couple of settings or making do with 100 hertz instead of 120 although what are the minimums do you really care if it's a locked 100 hertz versus a jittery 120 this is better there are some games that i will get to that perform better than a lot better than 20 percent but this is not really flagship i think those numbers make it clear this is just the new upper mid range this is not better than 2080 ti flagship class performance and well let's let's get into the actual per game testing because there are some things people really are going to want to see if they're considering buying this card but first a very short ad from a sponsor Today's video is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. They build industrial compact designs that fit as much as possible into a customizable package that will stand the test of time. Buying this wallet once saves you the trouble of buying bulkier wallets every few years that will just wear out anyways, and that's why they give you a 45-day money-back guarantee. Use the link on screen and in the description to make sure Ridge knows I sent you, and if you do, Try to go there between March 14th and 23rd to get at least 15% off everything on the website with a special offer code. It'll give you a discount on everything, including their exemplary laptop bags that I actually do swear by. Use the link in the description. It really helps the channel. Buy Ridge today. All right, so as I've said before, I think the most useful thing I can provide is not rushing through a review with dozens of graphics cards and dozens of games that would just take 
forever, and I don't think I'll offer something better than what Hardware Unboxed would do with that. What I, what I can do, though, is take my time over a few weeks and tell you what my impressions are of the games I've been playing this March. And the first one I want to talk about is Deep Rock Galactic. Say what you will about this being a stylistic indie game, but I actually really do think this game is beautiful, especially the fire effects. In Deep Rock Galactic, I typically would play at about 1800p at 100 hertz, 100% Ultra with, I don't know, like a 90% resolution scale on my Radeon 7. With the 3070, though, I was able to run it slightly more stably above 100 hertz in full 4K instead of a scaled 1800p. And th that's ultimately what I decided to select most of the time. Some people will put the resolution scale down because I actually think it does look excellent with a lower resolution scale in this game specifically. So they could have a higher frame rate. But yeah. The summary is I was able to play Deep Rock Galactic at 4K instead of 1800p, and the frame rate was more stable. And the same story is pretty much what I would say about Bannerlord. In Mountain Blade Bannerlord, no, this did not perform as well as the 6800 XT that I believe actually was performing close to 50% better than this 3070 overclock to overclock. But, you know... Playing in 1800p on the Radeon 7 usually with around a 70 hertz frame rate cap, I was able to play this immediately in full 4K with constantly, or at least almost constantly hitting the 70 hertz cap. So I decided to take off the cap and, yeah, I mean, it, it generally stayed around 75 to 80. So that's what I kept it at. Capped at 80 hertz in full 4K. Uh, and, and, and actually in the siege sections that have massive frame rate drops with hundreds of people fighting in close quarters, I found the frame rate... Although usually the 6800 XT way better than the 3070 in this game, the minimums in the crazy areas were only 20 to 30% worse on the 3070. So what am I saying again? Basically, just like Deep Rock Galactic, in 1800p on the Radeon 7, with a 3070, you can expect to play this in full 4K and the frame rate will be more stable. Now, I wish that was the case in every game. We need to talk about Resident Evil 2. This one, I wasn't sure what to expect, considering it told me it required around 14 gigabytes of VRAM for the settings I was using with my Radeon 7 and the 6800 XT. However, I did note that I had played it on my 2060 laptop a few weeks ago for a couple hours while I was out of town, and... I I le maybe it wasn't in 4K, but I, I it said I shouldn't need more than 6 gigabytes, but it clearly didn't, and it was running fine. So I didn't know if it was all BS. You know, I booted up Resident Evil 2, set it to 4K, 100% Ultra, and yeah, with 90% visual quality, it was running almost entirely locked at 4K 120 hertz on the 3070. But this was in that early area with Ada, and I was like, this seems like a really easy section to run. I bet it's going to drop at a certain point. And there were the occasional drops randomly to 60 hertz out of nowhere from 120, which is a massive drop. Well, and then I got to the sewer section with Leon, and just watch this. It plummeted to below 30 hertz from above 100 out of nowhere. And when I changed it to 1440p, it locked to 144 hertz. You do not usually have a fourth of frame rate going from 1440p to 4K. Uh, I don't even think it usually cuts your frame rate in half. And so, guys, this is an example of 8 gigabytes of VRAM not being enough. 8 gigabytes, you know, having more than 8 or 10 gigabytes is not marketing. It is a real problem for a card that is selling for 700 fucking dollars on Newegg. 8 gigabytes is not enough. And look. I was able to change quality settings to 120%. It looked really smooth. It looks great at 4 k at 1440p, 144 hertz, and I actually beat the game over the weekend. You know, at those settings, I was happy. But it is annoying that there are some settings I could turn down before that I couldn't tell the difference between. And I was playing at about 4K 100 on a Radeon 7. I was forced to do 1440p at high refresh rates on a card that pretends it's stronger. And it is stronger. It is a lot stronger. I have a lot more to say about that soon, but just keep that in mind. This card should have more than 8 gigabytes. It really should. And there are real games, not even the latest ones. Resident Evil 2 did not just come out where you will have to compromise quality. I think you shouldn't have to compromise when you're spending this 
much. But anyways, let us move forward from that. I think I've made my point clear. If if we think of Deep Rock Galactic and Bannerlord as the standard comparison to like a 1080 Ti from a 3070, which is to say, whatever you are running in 1800p before, now you're running it in 4K with a more stable frame rate. And then if Resident Evil 2 is the worst case scenario where because of VRAM issues, you actually might have to run it at settings you think are worse than before, then I'd say there's a lot of games like Battlefield 5 where it's the more typical situation of a little better but not that noticeable you know playing in battlefield 5 i used to do like 4k at 80 percent resolution scale somewhere around there on the radeon 7 and then with this i just do full 4k 100 and it's typically closer to 110 i actually didn't see a point in lowering resolution scale because it didn't gain much performance back and it was always dropping to 100 no matter what i did so i just keep it at about 100 hertz typically running around 110 full ultra or, or I think without um, post-processing, because I think that's a complete waste in Battlefield. And almost full ultra then, and 100% resolution scale. A better experience. A noticeably better, but not that noticeable. Like, I was getting 100 hertz either way with good image quality settings. I can't say it made me more competitive. I can't say it made the game more fun. And that's most of what you're going to get going to this from, like, a 2080. Most games, it's not more fun. But there were a couple that were good, but there were, was one or two where the VRAM was an issue. And yeah, I'm not going to get into the ray tracing too much in Battlefield 5. It had the same visual issues the 6800 XT and 2060 had. And I have tried ray tracing in other games. And I stand by the majority of ray tracing games, even Control, I think just make metal objects look like chrome vomited everywhere. Vomiting chrome all over everything that's metal is unrealistic. It's distracting. It doesn't look good. Putting blurry, low-resolution reflections on floors just make the floors look ro low resolution. The pre-baked lighting often looks as good or better. That is my opinion. Take it or leave it. I, I, I just think a lot of people are honestly trying to convince themselves that the ray tracing is worth it. I really don't think it is. The exception of Minecraft RTX. This one, I have to say, did impress me. Now, to be fair, without DLSS turned on, I would say the 3070's frame rate was pretty similar to the 6800 XT. Maybe 10% better, but it had a bizarre input lag issue without DLSS on that made it basically unplayable, worse than the 6800 XT. However, with DLSS on, it was absolutely playable with RTX on, and it looked beautiful i would have no problem playing the game like this 24 7 well with the exception that there's a 24 chunk view distance and that's less than half what i'm used to i usually play with like 64 to 80 chunk view distance which does affect gameplay when you're searching for distant towns and stuff over mountain ranges that's an issue, but for the people that don't, I guess, play in rooms where they want to look over large distances, yeah, I mean, the 3070 with DLSS and ray tracing on, it works. It works more than playably with a card that you should expect it to, and it looks beautiful. And what also works beautifully is editing. At least in the timeline, the 3070 felt smoother than the Radeon 7 editing in the apps I use, and it didn't have the weird inconsistent frame rate issue the 6800 XT had. It also seemed to output videos slightly faster than my Radeon 7, which again, the 6800 XT didn't seem to do that. And it didn't have any of the artifacts I saw on the 6800 XT in some of my apps. I can honestly say this was better for me in professional tasks compared to the Radeon 7. And in fact, in mining, it's worth pointing out this gets about 60 mega hash after tweaking, which is pretty close to a usually far more expensive 6800 XT. Although... Let's keep in mind, the 6800 XT was, I believe, using under 150 watts the whole time, whereas this uses 200. So technically, if they got even remotely close to the same price, I could see Big Navi selling out to mining firms as well. I just think Ampere is the obvious choice right now. And outside of that, I'm not really sure what else there is to say. I mean, look... Uh, I would say anyone who's been using Radeon overwhelmingly for the past five years should just expect little issues when going to a new graphics card on their desktop. I think anyone would expect that going back and forth 
you know, between these vendors. Uh, I had like a controller app that didn't work with NVIDIA experience overlay. You had to log in to use GeForce experience, which I think is idiotic, you know, and weird that they want to, that they're forcing you to, you know, let them collect your data. If you want to use the same features, Radeon lets you use. Uh, it doesn't include built-in overclocking, although I will say MSI Afterburner worked great. And, you know, these are the overclocking settings I had. Honestly, if you look at the results from my benchmarks, you can see I almost got a linear performance increase with increasing bandwidth or much more than you would expect for how little I touched the core. So, yeah, that's overclocking. Um, that's the weird – I'm not going to dive too much more into the weird little issues that I had to deal with. I don't, I don't think it's worth dwelling on it. At this point, I have no – problems using the 3070 and well yeah so what is there really to say then i think it's about time we start wrapping up this review well look at the end of the day what i will say about the 3070 is this i like ga104 itself i, I do this thing uses around 200 watts there's plenty of games that run at mu a decently better quality than my Radeon 7 while using less energy. None of the excessive 400 watt issues of the the uh, 3090 and the 3080 while also gaining decent performance when you overclock the memory. I, I like GA104, but in its current consumer iteration, which is the 8 gigabyte 3070. I just have to say that this feels like what should be a $450 card, not an above $500 or an above $700 card. This is not a $700 card. This is not really a high-end card. This is an upper mid-range card just like the 5700 XT. 5700 XT launched you know, late 2019, we are now in 2021. And so something like, you know, I don't know, 30% better than that, which is about what this is, with the same amount of memory as cards from two years ago, shouldn't cost twice as much. This isn't worth that type of money. And in fact, I can't help but feel a little disappointed in how NVIDIA decided to release this to consumers. You know, this isn't the full die. The full die is over 6,000 CUDA cores. They could have given this the full die. They could have given this 16 gigabit per second memory, which I've demonstrated it would just gain. You know, if they did that, this would just be at least 10% stronger. And they could have given it 16 gigabytes of VRAM. If they would have done that, made it, you know, 10, 15% stronger, it would have been very close to a 6800. And with 16 gigabytes of VRAM, it wouldn't have had the VRAM issues that I ran into. This, There's plenty of games where I'm sure this could have been gaming around 4K 120 if it had enough RAM and just that little bit of extra grunt. They could have charged a $550 MSRP or almost the same as a 6800. Yeah, the rasterization performance even after that, you know, the faster memory and the full die still would be a bit like 10% below a 6800. But it has decently better, but it has, you know, about the same or better ray tracing. It has DLSS, which there's a couple games where it really does work. That's coming to Mountain Blade Bannerlord. That's something I'm considering. This could have been an almost 6,800 competitor, a $550, 16 gigabyte gold standard for entrance to the high end. But it's not. And so it should be 450. And that is really my overall opinion of the 3070. But here's the thing. You might have noticed that I've been holding the box this whole time and that I was holding the actual 6800 XT in the review for that. Well, the reason I was holding the 6800 XT in my previous review is that I had to get it out of my system right away and put the Radeon 7 back in because it was causing me troubles editing and rendering videos. Not so the case with the 3070. I like it staying in my system doing that. And while I don't think it's worth $450, I don't think my Radeon 7 is worth $2,000 either. And that's where we get to an uncomfortable conversation here. I'm going to let everyone know that I'm moving soon. And I'm looking to build a studio for Moore's Law is Dead to use over the next few years. And if I can get two grand for a Radeon 7, if I can get six or seven or eight hundred, nine hundred dollars $900 for a Vega 64... And I can keep this for like around 600 I just think I'd kind of be an idiot to not keep the 3070. And so 
This brings us to a very uncomfortable conversation I think PC gamers need to start having with themselves. What is the price of your hobby or the price of having your hobby at a certain level of performance? You know, I've long said that I don't actually need this level of performance. I was more than happy with, I mean, effectively better than 1080. As long as it was stronger than a GTX 1080, I've been happy with that level of performance jumping between cards for the past four years. You know, some people would want a 2080 Ti level. Some people would want a 1080 Ti level. Some people, I think a lot of people, are more than happy with something around an RX 580. A lot of my friends still use those, and they don't care. They're just gaming 1080p 60 at high settings. They don't care. What level of visual quality do you actually need to be happy with your gaming? Think about that, and then think about how much money you could get for some of the cards you're holding on to right now, because what miners are willing to pay for our graphics cards right now is absurd. And I do believe that not in the next week, not in the next month, but that in the next half year, prices will be coming down. I think we're almost to the peak of scalper prices. You can already see them leveling out and kind of going down slightly over time now. I believe Hardware and Box talk about this recently, actually. And if that's true... Some of you need to ask yourselves, if I have an extra 580, should I sell a graphics card for one $2,000 and just slum it out for a few months? If I have an Xbox Series X or PS5, is that good enough for me when I can get two grand? What is your hobby worth? Because right now it feels like we are being used and abused, especially with NVIDIA limiting mining performance. But there are ways that we can profit off of this insanity. We can profit off of this third wave of a gold rush that I've described in other videos by selling the shovels to miners at inflated prices. And even though I don't think this card should cost more than 450 that's what I've decided to do. It edits better. It games a little better on average. Although it's not perfect, as I showed in Resident Evil 7. But... I, I just think I'd be an idiot to not get money for my Vegas right now if we're at the peak of scalper pricing and use that money to reinvest it into the channel. And I think it's time for all gamers to start asking themselves that. And outside of that, I'm really not sure what else there is to say. This level of performance is about 450. And if you could actually get a 6700 XT with 12 gigabytes, so more than this for about 480, it's okay. It's not great pricing. Any more than that, though, and I would just unfortunately recommend you try to get stuff near to 20, within 20% 20 of MSRP and sell off your old graphics cards because of how much you can make off of it now. That's the honest advice. That's what I've decided to do. That's what I'm telling you to do. That is the awkward ending to this review. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed this. I'll have much more to say about this in the upcoming Broken Silicon where I actually have early information on 6700 XT reviews from some of my contacts. So look out for that. Also, some insider information on the 3080 Ti. You know, if you are a Patreon member, you'll get that episode early and ad-free in addition to mountains of exclusive content like the Dive Shrink podcast that only patrons get access to. So, you know, consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and ringing the bell button so you don't miss all the coverage coming out soon. I will have another very high-end card I'm reviewing soon. Not one you think of. It's not a 39 or 6900 XT. It's something fun. Hopefully that works out. But otherwise, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.